Hello everyone. This is Sean Burnick here from Rainbow Tree Care. Good morning or good afternoon depending on where you're at. We'll get started in a couple minutes here. Hello everyone, this is Sean Burnick from Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you today from uh, warm, balmy Minnesota, where we are going to reach the mid-20s today, uh, but spring is sprung here. We hit the 50s earlier this week, and hopefully where you're at, wherever you're joining us from today, uh, you have some warm temperatures either currently or on the horizon. Today I'm going to be speaking about tree health care treatments and pollinators. And before I dig into the presentation, I would like to address a little bit of housekeeping. This is part of Rainbow's Spring Education webinar series. And really the intent of these webinars is to provide short sessions on a variety of topics run into them over the lunch hour so they can be lunch and learns. Um, and you can see the list of uh, presentations, some of which that we've done already. And then we've got a couple more coming up here, uh, one tomorrow and then one next Monday. All of these presentations will be archived on our website for uh, future viewing. And uh, we always like to reach out to our audience and to the industry to uh, request any other webinar topics. And so if you have webinar topics from Rainbow to put on that are educational in nature, uh, please don't hesitate to suggest those to us. As far as your ISA certification to receive ISA credits for today, what I would like you to do is please type your certification number into the question box on the go to webinar toolbar area. If you just type your name and your number in that question box, uh, we'll make sure that you get credits for this presentation today. <clears throat> Today's presentation will last approximately 11 to 11.45, um, and we'll address questions at the end of the presentation, as many as we have time for. And what I would ask you to do for questions in the chat box, or in the questions box, excuse me again, to type any questions into that area on the toolbar, and we'll address those uh, at the end of the presentation. As mentioned, my name is Sean Burnick. I'll be your presenter today. And then we also have my colleague Peter Vu, uh, who works with uh, Rainbow's uh, marketing staff. He is also a, on as a uh, co-presenter and will be assisting with any questions and any technical difficulties that we might have. A little bit about my background for those of you that do not know me. Um, I grew up on a dairy farm in central Wisconsin, so a farm kid. Uh, my graduate degree is in plant pathology from the University of Minnesota. I actually did my work on a 
plant pathogen on turf grass called Dollar Spot. Never thought I'd be working with research, but uh, here I am uh, today. Worked with uh, uh, the Forest Service for a little while, uh, getting into tree research, looking at uh, fungicides and their effectiveness on oak wilt. Um, and I have been with Rainbow going on my 11th year now. I direct our research and product developments and all of our technical support on our products and protocols, uh, working to train our internal staff and all of our uh, arborist partners out there on how to use our products and services. So today as we discuss tree health care treatments and uh, pollinators, what I'd like to start off with is a little bit of background information that would be helpful in setting the context to determine where all of the, I guess, hype, if you will, and some of the concern is coming from as it relates to the use of, in general, pesticides. Um, concerns uh, specifically in the tree care industry. To start off, I'd like to discuss uh, a phenomenon called colony collapse disorder uh, and another more generalized phenomenon called bee decline because I think it's helpful to know the history and a lot of uh, the research around these two phenomenons have led to uh, potential implications uh, with different pesticides over the years. Some of those grounded in science uh, and some of those uh, more opinion or uh, false claims. But the first one is, is colony collapse disorder. And this is the phenomenon where you see a large-scale loss of European honeybees. And it started in the U.S. in around 2006, 2007. And it was an odd phenomenon where a high percentage of worker bees left the hive and didn't return to the queen uh, or their food source for whatever reason. And although uh, certain pesticides have been implicated, and in, in specifically the ones that we'll talk about today, which is the class of insecticides called the neonicotinoids. Research is really pointing toward other probable causes, uh, and some, in fact, that go against the claim that these neonicotinoid insecticides are the cause. And, and uh, to that point, it looks like there's multiple factors that cause this, this issue called colony collapse disorder, including pathogens, a mite that impacts uh, honeybees. Um, and there's a, a number of factors pointing to uh, basically factors other than the neonicotinoids being implicated in this. And one of those is that in countries where neonicotinoid insecticides was, was stopped or curtailed, colony collapse disorder continued. And we've seen that in some European countries. Um, also in Australia, where they don't have colony collapse disorder, neonicotinoid insecticides are widely used there. Um, but we also don't see the varroa mites in Australia as well, which is interesting. And then in 96% of colonies where colony collapse disorder has been found to harbor a complex of different viruses, and so overall, the USDA and the EPA believe that there's a multitude of different factors uh, that are involved um, in pointing away from these neonicotinoids as being uh, involved uh, or having you know, a primary function. And certainly, more research is needed in this area. But as of right now, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, good research and sound science out there pointing against uh, these neonicotinoids. There's also a, what's called general bee decline, which has been around for a, a number of decades. And this is just the overall uh, decrease in number of managed honeybee hives uh, across the country. And it's from a variety of different factors, including urbanization and loss of habitat. Again, different pathogens and mite pests, uh, even beekeeper retirements and, and other causes that have led to a general overall decline in bee populations. So that's the history. More recently, though, in the past few years, we've had a lot of uh, both opinion papers, trade journal articles, and even a tremendous amount of research being done uh, that is really increasing uh, the awareness of bees, their 
decline and some of the, the uses of pesticides and their implications on it. You see a number of articles. I've, I've mentioned a few of them here, and I'll reference these at the end of it. But the Xerces Society uh, printed an article, Are Neonicotinoids Killing Bees? It's a review of research into the effects of these insecticides uh, on bees with recommendations for action. Um, and then there's a number of green industry groups that have provided some, some very good frequently asked questions documents. Um, and so there's, and you read a lot of this information on the, on the internet, and so distinguishing between science, uh, between false claims, what's real out there, where do we have research, where other data gaps can be quite challenging. But certainly over the last uh, couple of years, there's been a tremendous amount of hype. And I would also attest this in our industry to uh, more broad scale use of insecticides, especially to manage some of the invasive pests. So you see more of our insecticides that arborists are using under the microscope for managing things like emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle, and hemlock woolly adelgid. So naturally there's just more, uh, more use and more people are becoming aware of, of these pesticides being used as tools in the tree care industry. But really what raised the, the level of awareness uh, and was really all a lot of the hype of the green industry over this past year in 2013 was a bee kill incident in Oregon where over 50,000 bees were killed uh, in the spring of 2013 and it truly was the hype of the green industry. And so this was a scenario where a, a tree care company went into a commercial property in Oregon um, and actually the commercial property was complaining that they were all the cars that were parking in their parking lot were getting covered with honeydew and so the tree care company came in and determined that the trees had aphids and sprayed the trees with safari uh, actually in the early morning hours the trees were in bloom and these were lindens they were in bloom and, and bees uh, began foraging throughout the day, resulting in over an estimated loss of 50,000 bees uh, that were killed. Um, the photo in the lower right hand corner shows uh, after the spray applications were made, they actually went in and covered these trees with netting to try to prevent further bee kill. And some of the interesting things that uh, I've, I've noted with this particular scenario, number one, the trees were treated early in the morning hours. Uh, and number two, there was a number of uh, agricultural, it's in an agricultural area. There's uh, actually an alfalfa field right next to where these treatments were made. And so I think what happened is uh, the applicator went in the early morning hours, didn't know that the bees were visiting those trees. And, uh, you know, as the day warmed up, the bees came into the treated trees and uh, came into contact with the safari and led to the massive bee kill. It's a sobering reminder that we as an industry need to follow the label uh, language. Certainly as a foliar spray, these products have language about not treating trees that are in bloom or treating trees that are visited by bees during the day. And so this was attributed certainly to a misapplication of a foliar spray, but it really led to a lot of uh, hype and not, excuse me, not a lot of hype, but a lot of information going out in the media and again, greater awareness of um, insecticides and, and their impact that they can have due to a misapplication to, uh, to linden trees and other flowering trees. I think one thing that's important to remember here is that many insecticides when applied as a foliar spray can cause damage to bees. After all, they are insects and so we need to take precautions to minimize the damage when spraying uh, these, these products to trees that, that can come into contact with bees. <clears throat> and as a arborist practitioner, as we look at the tools that we use, different applications, products, and protocols, we have to go through a variety of different thought processes as we select the tool that we're going to use to manage uh, our customers' problems, our customers' insects. We're looking at certainly science and using science-based protocols and tools as our mo number one most guiding principle. 
but also we have to consider operations. Is the treatment fast, easy to apply? Are there multiple uses for that application technique or that product? Is the product and the service going to be profitable and cost effective for our customers? Uh, we're interested in using treatments and, and protocols in the industry that have longer retreatment intervals, especially when we're trading large urban trees and urban environments. If we don't have to go back and spray those trees multiple times throughout the season, that certainly is a benefit to us, the customer, and the environment for that matter. But another very important consideration, one that we're talking about today, is the treatments, are our treatments safe for the public, the environments, and the applicators? So I think it's important to take into consideration these, these various criteria in, and uh, including some of our customers' concerns around what the potential impacts of our products and applications are on pollinators and non-targets. So let's further define the neonicotinoids. And many of you are probably familiar with uh, some of the neonicotinoids in this insecticide class and probably have used them. Uh, the neonicotinoids are a class of synthetic insecticides that are similar in structure to the naturally occurring compound nicotine, which was used as an, and nicotine was actually used as an insecticide around World War II. So what manufacturers did was create a synthetic derivative of that naturally occurring compound. And these synthetic derivatives block a specific chemical pathway that transmits nerve impulses in the insect's central nervous system. And what's unique about these is that they are specific, the mode of action is specific to insects. So while they block nerve impulses in insects, they, they do not block impulses in mammals, birds, and other non-targets. So we can use these with uh, <clears throat> relatively low toxicity to mammals, birds, the people applying the product, so on and so forth. So much more effective on insects um, and much less toxic to mammals, birds, than some of the more conventional insecticides that were used, uh, and some of which are still used today as foliar sprays. Some of the benefits of these neonicotinoids includes uh, that they're systemic. And these systemic treatments, if you go back to imidacloprid, which was the first insecticide in this class that was used in the arborist industry uh, back in the early to mid-90s, this essentially revolutionized for arborist practitioners the way that we manage large trees in urban areas because it, we can now systemically treat 50, 75, 100 foot tall trees through uh, soil injection, basal soil drench, or tree injection by delivering the product uh, directly to the xylem and having it move up and translocate up into the tree uh, or applying it to the soil where it's absorbed by the roots and moves up into the tree. And so imidacloprid is the most widely used active ingredient uh, in the arborist industry and in fact in the turf and ornamental industry in general um, can be applied as a soil application, either drenching or soil injecting, or it can be applied as a uh, root flare injection. Dinotepuron, Transtech is Rainbow's formulation, can be applied uh, to the soil or to the bark of a tree, to the lower five feet of the tree, and we can see systemic uptake of the product there. Thiamethoxin from Syngenta uh, can be applied as a soil application, both the anodin as both the soil application of bark spray, and acetamepirid can also be applied as a bark spray, a foliar application, but to my knowledge that is not labeled for a soil application. Uh, and as I mentioned before, imidacloprid and dinotepuron are the two most widely used insecticides out of this class in the arborist industry. Imidacloprid and dinotepuron, part of why they're so important as a tool in the practitioner's toolbox is because they're used to manage large-scale infestations of invasive species, used extensively uh, out east for managing Asian longhorn beetle to eradicate it, ALB from uh, parts of, of the east coast. Um, also, dinotepuron 
and imidacloprid have been used widely by the USDA Forest Service and a number of our national park services to manage woolly adalgid. And more recently, over the past 10 years, uh, the use of these neonicotinoids for managing emerald ash borer, both for res residential, commercial, and municipal uh, properties has really led to a, a lot of wide-scale treatments of these products and, and really helping us to preserve high-value trees and preserve trees in our urban forest. And so these are valuable tools for managing these destructive, devastating pests. As I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the neonicotinoids can be applied as a basal soil injection uh, or a basal soil drench. That includes the uh, the Transtec Danotefuron active ingredient and Zytec, which is our imidacloprid active ingredient. And then thiamethoxin can also be applied to the soil as well. We can also apply imidacloprid as a systemic root flare injection using a variety of different uh, tree injection tools and techniques, delivering the active ingredient right into the xylem. Uh, where it's, uh, there's low exposure to the applicator and to the environments and using it this way. Uh, so there's a lot of great pros to these different application techniques with these neonicotinoids. And then the basal systemic bark spray, um, again, where we apply it to the lower five feet of the trunk. It moves in through the lenticels of the bark um, and into the xylem vessels where it moves up, protects the trunk and the above ground parts of the the canopy. One important um, feature about these different neonicotinoids is that they move upwardly through the xylem vessels. There's very limited to no downward mobility into the phloem. As I mentioned before, even though the neonicotinoids are not being implicated in causing general bee decline or colony collapse disorder, there still is, I think, reasons for uh, researchers and scientists to continue to look at their impact uh, from arborist applications in the industry. And some of those concerns uh, are raised from certainly these active ingredients are highly toxic to bees, um, especially when applied as a foliar spray. Uh, but they also are toxic, uh, you know, as an oral, uh, as they forage and feed as well. Uh, some of the neonicotinoids can have a, a longer residual, as compared to some of the more traditional sprays that have been used in the past. And we see that especially for imidacloprid. Certainly that's a benefit in some cases, allowing us to treat um, and not have to time our treatments as precisely. We can also do fall applications due to the longer residual of imidacloprid, but that also can have a, a there is the potential for that to be a, a negative as it uh, can increase the exposure uh, to some of these pollinators as well. And then when you look at the use rates as compared to agricultural treatments of these neonicotinoids, we're applying a much higher amount of active ingredient than what would be applied to a maize field or a canola field, for example, or, or for seed treatments in agriculture. Um, we're applying that higher active ingredient to the base of the tree or injecting it directly into the tree. And so I think we can avoid some of the implications of that. And when you look at agriculture, too, they're applying a much higher volume, overall volume, of spray solution when they apply it over acres and acres versus our applications are much more targeted. But still, there is concern of, of at these high rates, um, what the implications might be uh, to the trees that we're treating. A few concerns that, that I think lead us to uh, and some data gaps that we need to look at um, with our treatments. One of those data gaps that I think needs to be addressed is uh, you see a lot of information out there, but I don't think there's a lot of great research that's been done looking at systemic neonicotinoids that are applied using the rates, the application techniques, and the tools that we have in our industry to the 
larger trees that arborist practitioners typically treat. So do they move into the nectar and pollen from these types of applications that we're making? That still to me is an unknown. And because of that, I think we need to take precautions on some of the plant materials that are visited frequently by bees and pollinators. There is some research out there and actually uh, Dr. Johnson, Josephine Johnson, um, who did some research uh, on maples. She systemically treated maples uh, for the Asian longhorn beetle quarantine efforts out east and found that imidacloprid was not found in nectar. And she did find it in pollen, but at concentrations not expected to be of concern to honeybees. And so there is some research out there. One of the concerns still is, you know, are there any sublethal effects? Uh, even though the pollen was at lower concentration, are there any sublethal effects from uh, imidacloprid or some of these other neonicotinoids? I think one, one thing that's always stuck out for me, I mentioned before that these neonicotinoids move upward through the xylem. And when you look at pollen flowers, they're not significant sinks in the evapotranspiration process in trees. And we know that the concentration of these neonicotinoids when applied systemically are always higher in leaf tissues as compared to in flower tissues. And I believe what's going on there is because these products don't move through the, the phloem sap, <clears throat> that the opportunity for them to move or the potential for them to move into nectar is more limited. But again, I think research needs, more research needs to be done in this area to really look at this. And I think what's important about the research is that the research is done by a team of scientists who have multifaceted areas of expertise bringing together a working group with people who have experience with the arborist applications, techniques, methods, the rates, uh, experienced toxicologists, people who are experienced entomologists, um, and bringing together a team of people because this represents such a complex uh, question for scientists that we need to really look at uh, bringing a, a good team of people together so that we can do the research in an unbiased manner and really mirror and mimic the applications that are being done by practitioners at the rates and the treatment methods that we use. <clears throat> so as a result really of the Oregon bee kill, what we saw there is within days Oregon placed a temporary ban on the use of neonicotinoid pesticides and by August EPA had created new language to protect bees and other pollinators and really required uh, the majority of the neonicotinoid pesticide registrants uh, with foliar spray uses to immediately revise their labels. And one thing to be clear is that EPA stated that research by USDA has not demonstrated that colony collapse disorder nor the bee decline in pollinator health is linked directly to neonicotinoids. And they come out and state based on some USDA uh, data that pesticides in combination with other factors may be associated with declines. However, the relative contribution of these factors has not been identified. And so EPA really isn't doing this because of uh, necessarily solely because of colony collapse disorder or bee decline. It's more based on the potential effects and their concern of the neonicotinoid insecticides on honeybees. And so they wanted to create more clarity and highlight the potential pollinator risks and uh, really take a precautionary stance um, with applicators in response to the Oregon bee kill issue. So what, as I mentioned, what EPA um, has basically demanded from the different manufacturers and registrants uh, for four out of the six neonicotinoids is that all products labeled for outdoor use regardless of formulation type or intended end user. And that includes the active ingredients thiamethoxin, imidacloprid, dinotefuron, and cofianidin. 
are required to, under the direction for use on these product labels, are required to put in a pollinator protection box. And this basically provides more clarity on the application restrictions because of the risk to bees and other insect pollinators and uh, highlights that applicators need to follow the application restrictions. Um, it talks about ways to minimize exposure of, of, of the particular product to bees and insect pollinators when they're foraging or pollinating, minimizing, of course, any drift of the product to hives or habitats. And then it also references if you as the application company run into a bee kill, who you should report that to and provides the contact information. So this is under the directions for use under uh, the imidacloprid labels, the dinotepuron labels, both the anodin and the thiomethoxin labels. <clears throat> in addition, they've put in uh, this bee hazard icon for these neonicotinoid uh, products. And there's conversations going on right now with EPA that they may put this bee hazard icon onto some of the traditional foliar spray insecticides and other spray insecticides that could also uh, be detrimental when sprayed onto plants that, that pollinators are visiting. So they have this, right now, they have this bee hazard icon on the neonicotinoid labels. And then what I'll point you to here is the non-agricultural use. Uh, statements under the directions for use. Do not apply dinotepuron uh, tree care 70 WSP while bees are foraging uh, or do not apply to plants that are flowering. Only apply after all flower petals have fallen off. So they want to draw more attention to this. And this is for foliar applications only um, with a couple of exceptions. In the state of Oregon, for both the midocloprid and dinotepuron, they've taken it a, a one step further, and their state is not allowing uh, these active ingredients to be applied by any application to linden or other tilia species in the state of Oregon. And then Valent, as a company, has uh, decided to, across the country, on all of their dinotepuron formulations and their product labels, has also decided to adopt the do not apply this product by any application method to linden, basswood, or other tilia species. So that brings up you know, some of the challenges around managing Japanese beetle. And now dinotepuron would not be my first active ingredient of choice for Japanese beetle, but because of this new language, uh, you would no longer be able to apply that to Japanese beetle on tilia, on lindens, because of that new label language. And so these uh, labels, we're in a transition period right now where manufacturers are allowed to use up their current bottle labels that are on the labels, um, recognizing that uh, the new B language, the hazard icons, and some of this new language on dinotepter on that transition will occur over the 2014 year. I want to make you aware of this so you can start to uh, follow the current approved labels as they are now. So what can be done uh, to minimize the potential impact on pollinators with some of the arborist treatments that we use? Well, I think creating best practices for your company so that when you're asked by your customers uh, what you're doing to minimize this, you have different practices and approaches that your company has adopted um, to assure that you're minimizing any risk and you're utilizing uh, different tools in the toolbox to minimize that risk. And really, what I like about, um, and I've, I've went to probably a half a dozen conferences this year, and at each one of those, uh, there's a university extension person who is speaking on uh, something to the nature of this topic. And what I really liked, I, I attended a presentation down in North Carolina by a North Carolina State Extension entomologist who basically said what we want to do is to the best of our ability, preserve these tools as tools in the toolbox. And so looking at these neonicotinoids, being very judicious and intentional in the use of the neonicotinoids. And I thought he really put that in a, a good uh, way. We really want to be intentional with the use of these products. <clears throat> Certainly as arborists, we have a lot of different methodologies and a lot of different products to our discretion. And so I think looking at how these tools can minimize the impact of the environments 
in some of these non-target species that we're looking at. So some of the best practices that uh, I think would be important for you as a company uh, or for your organization to adapt is really to avoid, if at all possible, or minimize treatments to trees that are highly attractive to pollinators. We discussed the lindens already. Um, there's other pollinators, tree species that are uh, frequently visited by bees. Uh, tulip tree, black locust, golden rain tree, crab apple, and a few others. Um, and so really trying to minimize the treatments when these plants are blooming is, uh, I think, a best practice to start to adapt. Also, uh, there's concern about uh, flowering species that might be in the application zone where you make your soil application. And so avoiding treating to the soil if you have flowering plants within a couple feet of where you're making your soil injection or soil endrench um, is another best practice. Or going to, say, tree injection uh, or other methods. I think it's important, though, to remember, too, that some of the key species that we work with, some of those invasive uh, pests on, ash, hemlock, are wind pollinated. So it's not an issue. Um, and this continuously comes up at Emerald Ash Board conferences that um, I've attended. I think there's a lot of good research. Um, Dr. Herms at Ohio State um, has a group of his graduate students monitoring ash trees in the spring of the year when they're flowering. And to date, they haven't even uh, observed these um, foraging or, or visiting those ash trees during flower. Um, so looking at that, you know, there's still species where this isn't an issue on, I guess is my main take-home point. Mm -hmm. Properly diagnosing and knowing the history of the site, I think, is important as well. Making sure that if you're doing an insecticide treatment, that the root cause, or excuse me, that the part of the problem is actually caused by an insect. And so making sure that you properly diagnose the site, making sure you're working with the customer uh, to ensure that you know the history um, were these trees infested and attacked in previous years? Things that you can do to make sure that you're really making a proper diagnosis. Only treating labeled pests that are supported by science. And so with the midocloprid, dinotepteron, and these neonicotinoids, we know that they don't work against caterpillars and mites. But still to this day, uh, it's not uncommon for people in the green industry to bring this up as a question or even bring up that they're doing this as a service. And I think that's really a disservice to our customers because number one, they won't work. But number two, again, we're not intentional and judicious with our use. We're wasting the, the product and applying more insecticide into the environment than we need to be. <clears throat> Limit the pests treated. We've already talked about the invasive species. This is a picture from Illinois. Uh, basically, it's an ash graveyard except for some of the trees that were treated here. Uh, in the foreground and in the background, you can see some of them. But really being judicious with the use of these products for the devastating pests. For wood borers that are very challenging to treat with contact insecticides, especially on the infested trees where the larvae are internal to the tree. Um, and, and really targeting pests that you can't treat with other methods. And I know these are very critical tools in the toolbox, and you'd say, hey, we're treating large trees in urban areas. A lot of those trees are very impractical to treat with. And certainly I understand and see that, but are there other methods that you could consider that you could provide as a, an option to your customer when they bring up their concern over the potential to impact pollinators? Applying products at the right time of the year. Again, applying them at less than optimal times means uh, less than optimal protection and results. And it could mean more insecticide being applied than, than needed. Another thing that we'll talk about in a little bit more in depth when we get into our conversations with Japanese beetle is timing some of our treatments, whether they're sprays or soil applications, to be post-bloom, after flowering has subsided, for things like Japanese beetle. Getting into the application timing, uh, looking at a midocloprid, we know that it takes, can take 30 to 60 days to get up into trees. Um, don't apply the product to frozen or saturated soils where it may run off site or may not absorb to the soil particles. And with the midocloprid, we know we have to apply it in advance of an attack. 
we really want to be clear on the site history, know that the pest population has been in that area before we make a preventative treatment. With dinotephron and Transtec, uh, looking at the applications when the plant is, is actively transpiring, here we know that Transtec can get up into the tree in about half the time as a midacloprid, and certainly that can be a benefit as we can treat in the early stages of an insect population prior to large buildup and take um, more of an IPM approach, allowing the practitioner to really assess the condition of the tree in the site. So it's another tool that allows us to minimize some of our impacts because of the flexibility of this product moving into the tree more quickly. But again, Transtec has its limitations as well. We can't make late summer fall applications on deciduous trees. Um, there's really no data to support that application timing, so we don't want to make the treatments at that time of year. Making sure that the dosage rates that we use are appropriate for the pest. We don't have to always apply the high dosage rate for every single pest out there. Certainly that may result in some operational efficiencies, but there's certain pests like the sucking, uh, the sucking pests, uh, the aphids, the adelgids, pests are relatively easy to control, uh, especially on smaller shrubs under low pest pressure and on small trees. So you can use the lower rate, again, minimizing the amount of active ingredient that you're applying as compared to some of these other more challenging pests where the high rate is required. Calibrating your equipment seems common sense, easy to do, but a lot of companies, uh, I think, forget to do this on a regular basis. And again, that's going to impact your results and also impact the amount of product being applied as well. <clears throat> Proper site placement. When doing your soil applications, making sure that you're applying it to the mineral soil and not the organic matter where it's going to get tied up, um, and minimizing any runoff um, with, uh, with uh, soil injection. And furthermore, what I, what I recommend, we always recommend this, excuse me, with our canvas stat as a tree growth regulator, digging a moat right at the base of the tree so the, the tree growth regulator stays right where you apply it. And I think that could be a best practice adopted by companies to dig a small moat when they're doing insecticide applications as a drench as well, minimizing the impact and the movement off site, especially if you have flowering plants in the area. So to finish off here, let's take a real-world case uh, example of Japanese beetle and lindens. Certainly we know with minimizing our tools in the toolbox for lindens, they get hammered by Japanese beetle. Um, and so if we're really taking the, this challenge and this issue into concern, even though I think there needs to be more research with, this, uh, with these neonicotinoids, whether or not they move into the pollen and nectar, even on lindens, uh, we need to look at, from systemic applications that is, we need to look at um, addressing that concern as an industry. And I think uh, there's a few things that we can do. Number one, we can target spray treatments just after bloom, which happens to be actually great timing for the initial onset of adult feeding of Japanese beetles. And so there's a variety of different spray applications that you can time uh, based on the phenology of the host or growing degree days to coincide with that. Uh, the traditional pyrethroids, even the neonicotinoids can be applied as a foliar spray post-bloom to provide control with Japanese beetle. Now with Japanese beetle, we know that it's critical to have uh, a high level of control early on in this insect's feeding cycle during a year because once Japanese beetles start feeding, they attract more beetles, and it becomes much more challenging to control. Soil applications, we have a product called Lepitec, which actually moves up into the tree very quickly. Uh, it can move in as quickly as days to one to two weeks. And so, again, timing that post-bloom could be an opportunity to use a soil application. Challenges with Lepitec is it really only has a short residual of about 30 to 45 days. So we'd recommend uh, so that you get control throughout the Japanese beetle feeding period, uh, the duration of that complete feeding period to look at uh, two treatments per season. Something else that you may do just to ensure that you get the earliest stage of the Japanese beetle feeding is to, to do a spray treatment while on the property. And then while you're there, combine that with a Lepitec soil treatment to make sure you get the earliest phase of Japanese beetle with the spray 
and then once the lap attack kicks in and, and takes takes is translocated up into the leaves in about one to two weeks, that will cover you. Most of our spray treatments have a shorter residual of 10 to 14 days, really making this one a challenge to, to manage. So there's there's side challenges by moving away from some of our more traditional neonicotinoid systemic applications on lindens. This is a photo of Lepitec treated versus untreated trees, uh, lindens uh, in Ohio. Um, the, this treatment, I should note, it was made in early June, allowing for plenty of time of uptake. So that was actually a pre-bloom application. But Lepitec could be a, a treatment that you can pull out of the toolbox here for this. Mm. Other work being done with uh, actually a BT strain called Beetle Gone. Um, Beetle Gone works uh, solely on coleopterin. And so treatments, and, and this just happens to be at a low rate and a high rate versus an industry standard treatment of imidacloprid for permethrin and oil, we see that Beetle Gone can be just as effective as the industry standard spray treatment. However, Beetle Gone has to be applied every five to seven days. And so that's a drawback, a limitation. So you may have to spray it three, four, even five times for Japanese beetle throughout the season. But another tool in the toolbox to provide for your customers options. <clears throat> so I wanted to put some of the, where I, I pulled some of this information today as references that I have used. There's a, a good trade journal article by Dr. Rich Coles. The facts about systemic insecticides and their impact on the environment and pollinators. I put the Xerces Society article on here as well. And so we'll make those available or you can see the link there for where you can go and download those and we can make available a PDF uh, of Dr. Rich Coles' article as well. So with that, just a reminder to please type your ISA certification number into the question box so that you can get credit for listening in on the presentation today. And remember that we've got a couple more webinars coming up. Chris Haugen, who works as uh, one of our arborologists here, has a lot of great experience also on our research uh, and science team, is going to be talking about the use of modern plant growth regulators uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. Central Time. And then next week he'll be talking about uh, tree health care in the face of a changing climate. So tune into those. And then all of our previous web, uh, webinars, including this one, will be archived. With that, thank you for your time today. It was a pleasure speaking with you, and uh, certainly this is a, a challenge with uh, our industry, certainly even from a public perception standpoint, which I sometimes think is, is one of our biggest challenges. We have to look at the pros and cons of the different options we're working with, and I think by having multiple options in our toolbox, we can best address some of our customers' concerns uh, as reputable companies in our industry. So thank you very much. So what we'll do now for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, if you're able to stay on, uh, we can look and see if there's any questions that have been posed. I see uh, in Boston today, a statement more so, 75 degrees in Boston yesterday. Good for you guys out there. <clears throat> Question here, is there a good source that tells whether tree and shrubs are wind versus insect pollinated? That's a great question. I'm not aware of one that has pulled that together. For my reference, what I will do is uh, talk with a lot of the extension entomologists, and depending where you're at in the country, put together that list. Um, I've also worked with some of the entomologists who are on the ornament, ornamental entomology listserv, if you're familiar with that email listserv, the Whitney Cranshaw at Colorado State University puts together. 
and there have been conversations from the different entomologists across the country um, on the different flowering species, but I'm not aware of anything that is uh, compiled where it would provide that in a, a real user-friendly format. Maybe others are aware of something. Mm -hmm. I think a question here about just uh, clarification on neonicotinoids showing up in nectar and pollen. And certainly, as I mentioned before, that study from uh, Dr. Johnson, finding the, uh, the neonicotinoids, and that was a metacloprid in that example, were found in concentrations found to be not expected to be uh, lethal to honeybees. But I think what we need to do more research on is what are the sublethal effects. And as I mentioned in my talk for clarification, what really needs to be done is research at our use rates with the application methods on the larger trees that we're dealing with. Okay, other questions here. Uh, are you familiar with the secondary outbreaks of spider mites after use of a metacloprid for EAB management? Not specifically on ash, but I'm certainly familiar with spider mite, spider mite outbreaks uh, on other species from treatments of a metacloprid uh, to hemlock. And then also Dr. Ralph has some good research in Central Park uh, where they did see uh, an increase in mite outbreaks as well. Um, as as uh, one of the uh, the listeners here has wrote in, so I I can't speak to it on ash specifically. Is it plausible? I would say there is an opportunity for it certainly for treatments to cause a a secondary outbreak of mites uh, when using a metacloprid. Um, so we need to be cautious and concerned about that. Uh, we discussed some of the alternative treatments for Japanese beetle on lindens. Um, I didn't get into a lot of the uh, spray treatments that are available out there, uh, but we discussed the beetle gone and looking, working with our current tools and adjusting our timing to be post-bloom I think is a good way to go uh, to minimize any impact from pre-bloom applications. Uh, but there is a variety of different insecticides that have been tested on Japanese beetle. Um, and so they're, they're out there. I won't go into all the details on the spray treatments, though, today. Have I ever heard of significant bee kill incidents with spinosad? I can't comment on that question uh, to know for sure. Um, sorry about that one. What is the recommended time to treat for viburnum leaf beetle and with what? Certainly I know with uh, imidacloprid, either as a soil application or a spray, uh, you would want to time those applications so that the insecticide uh, is in those shrubs prior to uh, the leaf feeding stage of the adult beetle. And there's actually been a lot of research uh, out east on viburnum leaf beetle that shows a um can be effective on that. Recognizing that when you do a soil application, you need to leave enough time for uptake and translocation in those viburnums. Smaller shrubs like the viburnum, though, I can move into those plants fairly quickly, a matter of a couple weeks or so. Okay. Um, when will I have to get updated pollinator labels for my Zytec and Transtec, which I purchased in, uh, in previous years? Mm -hmm. 2014 is a transition year, so the manufacturers, including Rainbow, will have a time period where we can update our bottle labels. And so we, we produce our bottle labels in different uh, increments. And so what EPA allows the different registrants to do is to cycle through the current labels that are on the product bottles. Those are the labels that you need to follow. Uh, but as a best practice, given that you have this information ahead of time, you can start to adopt and use the current uh, EPA-approved labels 
which may not necessarily be on the bottle as of yet. So at some point in 2014, you're going to start to see these different um, bottle labels transition over. Is it okay to treat lindens with Zytec in late fall to take care of Japanese beetle or will it harm bees? That's a great question. That's one of those questions I think that needs to be addressed in research. Um, I think you're going to minimize uh, any potential impact by, by treating later in the fall, but you also have to remember that the carryover, the residual of the midacloprid will be there. And so it's a little bit of an unknown as to whether or not Number one, does it move into pollen and nectar from that late fall application um, or not? So, it's, so it's, uh, I, I don't know how to answer that one. I don't have the research specifically with that scenario, and that's one of the data gaps that I think uh, is out there. And so if you have customers with uh, concerns on that, it's something that uh, you may want to address with some of those other options. And then we've got a gentleman actually from um, Florida who has, is dealing with the white fly outbreaks. And they have uh, a lot of issues with honeydew and sooty mold down there. Um, ideas for trunk injection of palms to control white flies. Um, I'm not sure about the application methodology for injecting palms. I know that they do not deal very well with the injection wounds. Um, I, I'm more familiar with uh, companies treating and managing the white fly outbreak uh, with soil applications on palms. Certainly they're using tree injection treatments uh, on other, other non-palm species in Florida, uh, especially to get the faster uptake and translocation. Uh, but on palms, I don't know if you would, uh, and I do know they're treating lethal yellowing on the, the dwarf coconuts down there with the tree injection treatment of oxytetracycline. Just not sure about uh, the use of tree injection on palm for an insecticide. I would recommend going with a soil application instead. Last question that I'll address here is there, that I have here, excuse me, is there potential for increased mite activity after a dinotepteron application? Well, that's interesting that you uh, bring up that question. At this point in time, there's no research to suggest that dinotepteron would cause mite outbreaks. In fact, uh, I'm aware of some science from Purdue that would suggest uh, that it doesn't occur. Uh, however, given that it is a neonicotinoid, I think we want to keep an eye out for mite outbreaks on dinotepteron. I've asked that question uh, a number of times in conferences with practitioners, and no one has seen that um, in their treatments, in their operational treatments, but it's something I think you want to keep a watch out for. But at this point in time, not aware of any, any issues with that. So, Okay, with that, great questions, by the way. And uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to me um, via my email address. Uh, or my phone number there. And we'll go ahead and keep the webinar live for a few minutes yet if people are still uh, filling out their CEU credits and need to get those in. Thank you and uh, have a great spring and good luck with business.